As many as a thousand people were forced to flee as fire closed in, and for them, it was quite simply a race against time. Take a look at this extraordinary video. Oh my God, look at that. Jesus We're actually doing, our house is actually doing pretty well so far. Holy shit, that's fun. Gordon Murray, his partner, and their pets were among those who escaped. They recorded their terrifying drive out. They are now safe, staying with family here in Vancouver. And I asked Gordon about the moment he knew he needed to leave Lytton. The cell service quit because we were trying to check, you know, to see if there were any emergency orders or any information about what was happening because we could see there was a lot of smoke, but there we couldn't find anything and then but then the cell service died and the power went out and we knew that it was serious so that's when we just gathered everything as quickly as we could got to the car uh, got our cat and a dog and because we had to leave so fast we couldn't find one of the cats we had to leave her behind which is uh, very hard but um, then we just got in the car and f had to figure out where to go because there was no information. And so we tried to go to where the smoke was thinnest, um, but it was only thin for a while and then there were flames all around. It was unbelievable. Where our house was, there weren't flames everywhere. There was smoke everywhere. And so we only realized how bad it was when, when we got down to that road and started driving up it and saw those houses just like literally, I mean, we could actually hear the, the timbers exploding as we were driving along and the poles, I, I think the, the poles were exploding. It was just, it was like being in a movie. <laughs> that's, that's, it's hard to express how shocking it was. Oh my God. And the chain's gone. In some of the video, you're on the Trans-Canada Highway and, and I'm looking at your view and I can't tell sometimes like what's ahead in the road, that must have been scary too. Well, yes, that was definitely one of the, the most difficult point parts, not knowing whether we were gonna, I mean, we did come around a corner and have big flames shooting out on one side or the other, but fortunately never both sides at the same time that would actually, you know, stop us. But it was, it was very uh, touch and go. And it could have, you know, and, and we heard from people that that whole area that we drove through just became one massive fire. In fact, it's, it created a huge ash cloud that actually floated across the Thompson River and started a fire on the other side wow. because there was so, the flames were so intense right in that area that we had just driven through. We finally saw a little bit of sky beyond the smoke and we realized that we were going in the right direction or a direction anyway that was, that was going to get us out of that. And all of this chaotic and, and you, you didn't really have a plan other than just get out. Yeah, no, we didn't have a plan. We didn't have any information. That's the other thing is that there was no, we didn't, nobody had, had although there was a, a, an order to evacuate, we didn't, it had happened almost an hour before we left. We didn't know anything about it. We didn't know where to go. And, and as we, we drove further, people would say, oh, well, there's something over there. You can go and check. And, and there would be nobody there, they wouldn't have power. So I, I just wanted to say it's really kind of a microcosm uh, of, not to put too fine a point in it, but climate change. Because we are, um, it's, an, it's a small rural indigenous low income community and we're at the point, the spear point of climate change, but it's coming for everybody. We're the canary in the coal mine. We, ha we had the heat and the chaos, but we weren't prepared. And I don't believe that society is prepared in the same kind of way. And so we have to, as a society, work together to get ready and to make changes now. Because as we discovered, if you are scrambling at the last minute, you leave people behind scrambling at the last minute to the extent that you literally left with the clothes you have on right now. This is what you were wearing yesterday. You're with friends, presumably, in Vancouver? With, yes, family. W what's next for you? Well, th that's, we don't know. When we left, our house was still standing, but we have no idea what, what, it's, what is there now. Um, and so we, it's just one, not even one day at a time. It's one hour at a time. Um, we, 
hope to be able to go back and find out what what happened there but the, the pictures that have been in the media are not encouraging it's like apocalyptic scenes of whole blocks just not even being flattened but being just disappearing in the flames so uh, it's it's it is hard to know how to keep going but you just have to and even if your house is still standing we know a lot of the structures in Lytton were burned down it is a small village I, I've been through it before tiny uh, if your house is still there, will you go back there and live? I, well, nothing's, nothing's for certain, but I, I feel that we, I, I like to feel that we would. I mean, it's, it's a much larger community. It's a very small, Lytton itself is very small, but as I said, the area is 80% indigenous and there's a lot of small communities all around, many of whom have also been burned down and been affected by this and been affected by climate change. but. There is still a very strong sense of community there that, that we cherish and that we want to continue to, to be involved with. All right. Well, Gordon, thank you for speaking with us, and I, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you for having me.